Welcome to our talk about student experiences in the University of Puerto Rico space program. What is VARA? VARA is a software modem. It uses an advanced technique called OFDM. It's available for HF as well as FM. You may be familiar with it from WinLink. Find out more at the link in the slide. Hello everyone, my name is Carlos Roy and I'm a mechanical engineering undergrad student from the University of Puerto Rico. I am a member of the UPR RockSidex team that uh, constructs experiments that are launching a sounding rocket as part of the RockSidex initiative. Uh, the RockSidex program is sponsored by Colorado Space Grant Consortium and Wallace Fly Facility and the Puerto Rico Space Grant Consortium. And this uh, platform provides us with a low cost access to space where we can launch experiments. Um, now in a short while we're going to present to you a, a video that explains to you the, the partnerships and the process of constructing the experiments. Within the University of Puerto Rico, the students and professors are recipients of a NASA space grant through the RockSatX program. Open to colleges and universities throughout the U.S., the grant provides a platform to develop payloads placed on NASA sounding rockets launched from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. opportunities are preparing the future generations of aerospace engineers and scientists. Um, the RockSidex programs provide students the opportunity to construct experimental payloads. Um, the RockSidex team incorporates students from different fields. Um, these fields include physics, chemistry, biology, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and computer science uh, students. These students collaborate to design, construct, and assemble an experimental payload during a year. After this, the students go to Wallops Fly Facility where they uh, take part in the integration, testing, and, and launch of the sounding rocket. After that, they can uh, collect their experimental payload and examine their results so that they can um, complete their final reports and learn from those experiences. In this slide, we present the different experiments that the, that the University of Puerto Rico has accomplished during the last decade. Uh, as you can see, from 2009 to 2012, uh, experiments for the Rocksat C mission were completed. And the mission of these uh, experiments was to collect aerosols. Afterwards, in 2011 and 2012, uh, two experiments that were in charge of doing mass spectrometry experiments were completed. Then we changed our mission in 2013 to measure the impact of micrometeoroids using piezoelectric sensors and this mission was um, uh, performed again 
in 2014. Uh, in 2015, the mission changed again to collect micrometeoroids, but this time we were interested in including cross-contamination mitigation procedures. And this mission has been worked upon uh, in the next years all the way to the present. So as you can see in the images in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, we have worked with uh, the same experiment. However, we have learned many lessons during these years and the sample collecting subsystem has changed uh, because of different aspects that have failed in the past and currently we have a sample collector that is being constructed to fly in 2021. In addition to these experiments, we had the opportunity to launch an experiment to the Aurora Borealis in Andoya, Norway in 2019 where we were looking to characterize the Aurora Borealis. The Roxat X program and the Roxat C program uh, branch from the Roxat, pro uh, Roxat program that's sponsored by Cloudall Space Grant Consortium and Wallops Flight Facility. Uh, the main difference between these two uh, programs um, arise from the vehicle that they provide us to launch our experiments. In the Roxat C program the experiments are not able to be exposed to a space. That is, they fly inside a metal canister and they are not really exposed to vacuum conditions or, or space. However, in the Rockstar X program, the sounding rocket has a skirt that is that's deployed uh, after before they arrive to Apogee and that allows the students to complete another array of experiments and possibilities. And this is a parameter that we are uh, using in our experiment because we are looking to collect micrometeoroids at 160 kilometers uh, in the thermosphere. Now, this slide presents the concept of operations. And this is a conceptual map of what you're going to see in the video of the sounding rocket launch. Um, the important events of this mission include the following. Uh, the launch that occurs at t equals zero and afterwards at t equals eight, 80 seconds we have the skirt deployment and uh, approximately at 200 seconds we arrive at Apoi. then 30 seconds before power off at approximately 300 seconds we have uh, a power off flag and afterwards uh, approximately 6 kilometers of altitude the chute deploys and at the end of the mission, we have splashdown impact of the experimental payloads with the remainder of the sounding rocket. And now we're going to present to you a video of a launch that took place in 2014 so that you can see the experience of a sounding rocket flight.
Uh, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave to you Jorge Copin, which is a member of the RockSidex team. He's gonna continue explaining the science overview of the experiment. Hi, my name is Jorge Copin, and as my colleague showed you before, uh, we use a sounding rocket and a suborbital flight to collect micrometeorite samples. Now, why do we do this? Well, first of all, we aim to look uh, how far the extent of the biosphere of the Earth goes. Uh, what is a biosphere? Well, basically, what part of the Earth contains life? Uh, sounding rocket flights uh, reach a height of 160 uh, at apogee, which is a section of the thermosphere which, is not ex which cannot be explored by weather balloons or the ISS, which is at a much higher height of 400 kilometers above sea level. Now, we use this uh, platform from Rocksat as a place where we can collect samples of a region of the atmosphere that's not been collected by other experiments which aim to do uh, similar things, uh, like collecting aerosols and such. Well, from the Iowa Seagull Observatory, uh, there were measurements of micrometeorite and interplanetary dust particles which orbit the Earth after uh, some sort of meteoritic activity, let's say a uh, meteor shower and such. And from there, we found that the highest concentration of micrometeorite and interplanetary dust particles uh, stay at a height of around 90 to 120 kilometers above sea level. Now, from this, uh, we think that from the Bransperma theory, we can make assumptions that the biosphere of the Earth, which is sort of the extent of how, how life reaches Earth uh, in the atmosphere, could extend to the thermosphere, which is the height we currently collect in. And it's a height that no other experiment, such as weather balloons or the ISS, reaches. From there, we aim to test whether organic material is present above the Kármán line. The Kármán line is the agreed-upon boundary where the Earth's atmosphere meets outer space, which is known to be about 70 to 100 kilometers above sea level. Now, for this, we use the Organic Sample Collector for Astronomics Research, otherwise known as OSCAR, which is comprised of a, bellow, of a vacuum bellow system with aerodol tiles, such as this one, which decrease the impact speed of the micrometeorites uh, as the rocket is coming back down to Earth and gradually stops them and preserves them at the, uh, the conditions which, in which they were collected. An example of this can be seen from a 2013 flight where they use a different type of collector but it followed the same sort of uh, line of thought where we use aerodel samples to collect micrometeorite samples. And from electron microscopy you can see some of the samples which were collected of the micrometeorites. Okay, so now I'll just leave you uh, again with my colleague Carlos and he's going to go more into depth about the payload design for 2019 and 2021. Uh, in this slide, uh, you can see an experimental payload model design uh, using a CAD software. Uh, every year, in a sounding rocket flight, 5 to 10 experiments uh, built and designed by students of different uh, universities across the nation are integrated to a sounding rocket um, vehicle. As you can see uh, here, in this uh, 3D model, we have uh, several subsystems which include a sample collecting subsystem, um, electronic uh, components, and um, a cross-contamination mitigation subsystem. Um, in the image, you can see uh, some red components that are um, dynamic parts that are compressed and, and moved by the stepper motors that are part of the sample collector. As you can see here, there's a one mechanism and one collector from 2013. This uh, collector that you see here has been developed upon the lessons learned from this collector and collectors from the years uh, prior to 2019. Uh, in addition to this subsystem, we have the electronic components that we use to control the, the software and the electronic components like the UV lamps and the flight computer that gives the commands for the deployment and other uh, functions. In addition to this, we have a, a MinION, which is a portable DNA sequencer that we were looking to certify uh, for a TRL9, which is a technical readiness level 9, which means that we are looking to certify this instrument so that it withstands the harsh aerospace uh, conditions. 
Um, as you can see in this slide, this is a 3D model of the 2021 payload design of the University of Puerto Rico. Um, as you may expect to see in this image, it's similar uh, to the 2019 uh, experiment. Um, the main difference between these two experiments is the configuration of the sample collector. In the 2019 payload design, the sample collector is in a horizontal position and in this uh, experiment it's placed vertically to deploy in the line of symmetry of the sounding rocket. Um, another difference between these two experiments uh, includes some of the hardware that we are using in the experiment. For example, we are including um, a Leica camera to validate the sounding rocket flight in 4K video and in addition we are looking to certify another instrument that's called a Voltrax which is a portable sample preparator. Um, all these components uh, need to be sealed using O-rings um, to protect them from water breaching and in addition to all this uh, hardware we are including a cross-contamination mitigation subsystem that have been included since 2015 which includes um, in this year's and uh, 2019 uh, UVC lamps that help irradiate the external surface of the payload to denaturalize um, organic matter or DNA that's in the surface. Um, another comment upon, about these uh, cross-contamination procedures is that uh, the University of Puerto Rico in the Roxalex program has had the opportunity to include plasma radical source um, in their experimental payloads. However, in the current payload design in 2021, we have not included the, the PRS because of space constraints and weight. However, we have experience utilizing plasma radical source decontamination um, systems in experimental payloads. Uh, furthermore, uh, I'm going to leave you with Jorge Copin again. He's going to expand on the uh, cross-contamination mitigation procedures that we use in our experiments. My colleague mentioned cross-contamination mitigation systems we use within our payloads to ensure that the samples we collect are clean. But why is cross-contamination mitigation so important? Well, if we're really trying to find the extent of our thermosphere and we want to claim that we found microbes or DNA or any other sort of other thing at the thermosphere, we have to prove that we collected it at the thermosphere and it's not some stowaway DNA or contamination that one of our students or one of our uh, PIs put into the payload while we were uh, assembling it here on Earth or something that could have uh, gone into the payload as we transported it from Puerto Rico to Wallace Fly Facility in Virginia. And so for that, we have different cross-contamination mitigation uh, steps, which go from all the way from pre-flight towards in-flight and after-flight for when we do post-sample analysis. For the pre-flight, the, pre the aerogels are heated to about 170 uh, degrees Celsius for about an hour. And then the aerogels and other mechanical components that are part of the payload are transferred to a clean lab that's an ISO 4 level or cleaner. Uh, mechanical parts are cleaned with 5% sodium hypochlorite and 70% ethanol solutions. Uh, and the aerogel components are exposed to about, uh, for about 20 minutes to UVC radiation in the 254 nanometer range. Uh, the Oscar is fully assembled inside the sterilization hood and then it's heated again for about 170 Celsius for an hour. Now for in-flight, as my colleague mentioned, we use UVC lamps which are integrated into the payload uh, which uh, decontaminate uh, all the surfaces within the payload. Another step we take into making sure the payload is completely clean is that when we're assembling, we polish every surface so that the UVC lights uh, can propagate and irradiate more surfaces, uh, not only within the payload, but within the rocket skirt which is a section of the rocket that we don't control because it's part of Wallop's flight facility. So we have to find ways uh, to clean it 
uh, beforehand of the flight. Now for post-flight, we use similar methods to pre-flight, uh, such as the heating and the cleaning with the 70% ethanol solutions and the 5% uh, sodium hypochlorite solutions. My colleague also mentioned the use of a min-ion at both tracks and the different uh, 2019 and 2021 payloads respectively. Now the reason why we're flying this DNA sequencer technology, other than just proving that it can survive the harsh conditions of, of uh, aerospace flight, uh, is that we're working towards autonomous sequencing in extreme outer space environments. Right now the MINAIN is a great portable sequencer, but it still requires uh, human intervention such as preparing samples and loading, loading them into the MINAIN and then running the different samples uh, through a computer. So why do we, what do we do to mitigate this? Well, we use a ball track, which is a sample preparator from the same company, which removes the step of having to prepare samples in a lab. Uh, further uh, creating this uh, portable technique which we can use. Now, for future missions, we want to create systems that integrate both the ball tracks and the MinION into a single device so that we can just collect the samples and load them directly into a sample preparator which then sequences uh, the different samples uh, so that it can all be done within the 15 minutes that the flight takes place. This will allow us to not only collect but also sequence samples uh, within the 15 minutes that we're allowed uh, in the flight. Uh, this is uh, to further improve within the cross-contamination mitigation methods because the samples are collected before they can come back to Earth and get contaminated in, a, in any sort of way. Now, while our goal of autonomous sequencing can be many years away due to the lack of some existing technologies which we need to develop, such as microfluidic manipulation of the samples, we can still get uh, sample analysis of the samples we currently collect and to maintain the cross-contamination mitigation methods, we will use a ultra-high vacuum uh, chamber system for sample analysis, which my colleague will explain further. Uh, future work. Uh, as Jorge Copin mentioned previously, um, we want to use ultra-high vacuum technologies to develop standardized vacuum procedures for raster materials. Um, in order to achieve this, uh, currently we are writing uh, proposals uh, whose funding will go potentially to acquiring um, this, this um, equipment and potential instruments to complete post-flight analysis of the samples that we collect in the thermosphere. Uh, in this slide, we have a map that outlines the different analyses that we are looking to perform to the samples collected in the thermosphere. Um, this uh, map is subdivided into two groups. Um, an abiotic uh, group of analysis and a biotic group of analysis. As you can see from the presentation so far, the University of Puerto Rico has a track record of completing experimental payloads during the past decade. Uh, the Roxat X program provides the university with a platform to incorporate ham radio telecommunication experiments. For example, experiments that include VARA, which is a high speed. Uh, data protocol software model. Utilizing the RoxatX platform, uh, we can involve youth from the ages of 13 through 24 of the United States nation. This is important because uh, currently the, the projects that we have performed only include students from Puerto Rico. However, in this uh, other idea of using uh, telecommunications experiment, we could involve uh, youth members from all over the United States. Uh, all these students or youth members will be in charge of designing, constructing, assembling and uh, recopilation of data of the experiment. Uh, the idea of implementing VARA in the uh, experimental payload that flies in a sounding rocket is to certify um, the use of the VARA high-speed uh, data transmission model so that we can use it as an alternative to the conventional methods of data transmission in sounding rocket flights. This could have a potential influence on future space exploration missions or other sounding rocket uh, missions. VARA uses a orthogonally frequency division multiplexing. Some of the advantages of orthogonally frequency division multiplexing include the following. Uh, Multipath delay spread tolerance 
immunity to frequency selective fading channels, efficient modulation and demodulation, high transmission bit rates, flexibility, easy equalization, high spectral efficiency, resiliency to RF interference and lower multipath distortion. It's important to mention that BARA also has the capability of having higher signal to noise uh, ratios which are beneficial for the recopilation of data for, for the experiments that are performing sound rockets.